Phyllis was just 16 when war arrived on her small island. In the summer of 1940, Sark, along with the other Channel Islands, was occupied by the German Wehrmacht. I think it was ten and a sergeant. They had brought a car over and uh, they were giving the children rides in the car. They were men with families themselves and they missed their own children, you know. I think it was decided nobody wanted to leave, not the islanders. Uh, Forty English people left uh, on a private yacht, but um, the, the islanders didn't want to go. German planes bombed Guernsey and Jersey, killing 44 people. While in Sark, fishing boats were strafed by machine gun fire. It wasn't very nice hearing all the planes going over. You know, once we were in bed at night, we'd hear all this swayed about 200 going over, and we knew we were going to bomb England. And then two and a half hours later, we heard them coming back. And uh, the sound of planes at night it still brings it to me. I don't mind them during the day, but I hate hearing them at night. And I suppose it must be something to do with that. Ein Abstecher führt uns auf die nahegelegene kleine Insel Serk. German soldiers took over houses and dozens of islanders were deported to prison camps in Germany. We have 40 of them in the big house here behind me at one time, Pioneer of the Corps, and they used to line up in two rows every morning out here and um, we were just at the farm, just below, and we, they'd start to sing, and it was beautiful, all in parts. We would hear them singing every, every morning when they marched from here down to the Bel Air for some reason, I don't know, before they started the day, I suppose. It was really lovely uh, listening to them singing, and of course we learnt all the songs because we didn't hear anything from England, you see. An order was posted that all Sark children must learn German. Phyllis, a farmer's daughter, became star pupil. Well, that was started in June, and in December it was announced that the dame and the German officers would be coming to school to see what progress had been made. And the dame was going to present a prize. Of course, everybody knew who was going to get the prize. I was the only one who was interested. And I had to recite, I have it still to this day, a whole uh, poem from Goethe and uh, seven verses of it. So then I was interpreter to all the German doctors after that, till the end of the occupation, seven of them in all. They wouldn't go to the German doctor without me and the German doctor wouldn't go to them without me because uh, the old ones, the first three who came, couldn't speak English. So I had perforce to go along, but anyway. <laughs> I never regretted it. It was a wonderful education for me and experience. Meanwhile, Werner Rang, a young medical officer from Tamsbrook in Germany, had arrived to join the occupying forces. The doctor sent him to visit Phyllis. It was when I was ill. <laughs> I, was, I had a very bad tonsillitis. He turned up at the door at two o'clock in the afternoon when my mother was, a, was very deaf anyway, but she couldn't speak uh, German. And he couldn't speak English, but she saw he had his red cross on his arm and uh, had the medication. So she called out, she said, you'd better call this young man upstairs. She said, he's come from the doctor. So I invited him in German to come in and take a seat, you see. And I'm more astonished, but anyway. And it sprung from there. Well, he fell in love with me. It was love at first sight, apparently. Well, I said, well, I can't have been a very pretty sight because I could hardly <laughs> swallow and I had a uh, pillow and a towel here to catch my saliva. That's how bad I was. Werner became a regular visitor to Phyllis and her family at La Vie Farm. Just friendly, you know, played badminton at the hall and that sort of thing with some others. I didn't think of him as, as a boyfriend or anything like that in those days. Life was, you know, it was totally different to, uh, to the way it is now. In 1944, after the D-Day landings, life became even harder in the islands. Supplies were cut off and islanders and occupiers alike went short of food. There was absolutely nothing in the shops apart from the ration of one ounce of breakfast meal per head per day. 
There was the black market if you could afford it, but for ordinary decent people, it was always the same. No, I'm sorry, nothing. So we had to make the best of a bad job and struggle through on what vegetables we could get. The part that upset me most was when I went to a house one day where, with the doctor where a lady had a baby the night before and uh, the other children were sitting down to a meal of just boiled cabbage and nothing else and that upset me dreadfully. So then when I went home I said to my father, I, um, this, this family where the husband worked for my father on the farm and I said, oh, for goodness sake, I said, can you find Gerald some potatoes and vegetables? I gave him some on Saturday, but I said, yes, I know that, but I said, that's what I've seen. Oh, well, all right, I'll do my best, because they were, it was all so scarce, you see. They were digging the fields over and over again by hand. There were no tractors in those days. However, he sent him home with a basket of vegetables and potatoes, one of potatoes. And that's the worst I ever saw in Sark, apart from the German soldiers who were literally dying of starvation. Finally, relief came in the form of the Red Cross ship Vega. She brought us everything we'd been without for years. There was a Canadian and a New Zealand Red Cross parcel for everyone. Then in March, the Vega came again. But this time, the Germans were as hungry as we were, and troops who'd been fairly well disciplined up to now went haywire. They stole all the Red Cross stuff they could lay their hands on. We were just counting the days and we'd all be liberated. But then they were waiting for liberation as well, as I say, because that last year they were starving. This is London. The Prime Minister, the Right Honourable Winston Churchill. At last, in May 1945, those islanders who could listen in secret heard Winston Churchill give the message they'd waited five long years for. The ceasefire began yesterday to be sounding all along the front, and uh, our dear Channel Islands are also to be freed today. There was joy in the heart of everybody that sailed to Guernsey and the destroyer Bulldog to bring freedom to the Channel Islands. Off the coast, the destroyer anchored near to a rusty German minesweeper, from which came a representative of the enemy command. He was Lieutenant Zimmermann, a young man with all the most odious Nazi characteristics. He said he was not empowered to surrender, but only to discuss terms. When it was made clear that there would be no discussion, he returned to his ship for further orders. He had the audacity to hint that unless our destroyers withdrew until midnight, it might be the worse for them. The next German visitor to Bulldog was more sensible. With full power to sign unconditional surrender came Major General Heiner. He was received by Brigadier Snow, and in a few minutes the Germans signed eight copies of the document, some for Russia, some for America. After very nearly five years of German occupation, the Channel Islands were free. German guard was relieved of its duties. German soldiers were taken as prisoners of war and put to work. Well, the Germans have the thoroughly unpleasant job of removing the 200,000 mines they laid in the four islands. That goes for the barbed wire too. No one has suggested giving them gloves. Werner was sent to a prisoner of war camp in England. He was allowed one postcard at first and sent it to Phyllis. We had a long, quite long correspondence. He wrote me 160 letters. I could only manage 100 because I was working hard, whereas he had nothing to do. <laughs> the postman used to pull my leg because 
uh, the letters were coming fast and furiously. If he missed one day, he said, oh, well, you'll have two tomorrow, he said, you see, and all this. And um, I hadn't really thought about it in those lines. And then my nan, who was my great friend and mentor, said, I wouldn't be a bit surprised if you don't marry him. She remembered him, actually, from during the war. So um, I said, oh, gracious, this time I'll be thrown out. Oh, she said they'd get over it. <laughs> Phyllis went to visit Werner in Hampshire just days before he was to be repatriated to his hometown in the East German Russian zone, behind the rapidly closing Iron Curtain. Well, I left here on the, I think it was the 8th of May, not having any idea that I'd be married on the 13th. But anyway, <laughs> there it was, because he would have been repatriated the following day, you see. His kindness was really what decided it for me. He's terribly kind, very kind. But then I think most paramedics are. It's in their nature, isn't it? And he was very attractive, I must admit. With Werner still wearing his prisoner of war uniform, the couple were an unusual sight on the streets of England. Somebody called out one day, we were walking along somewhere, and they, something, uh, why don't you keep to your own, they said to him, and so on. So we didn't answer. This chap was in a lorry going by. I said, oh... Ignore it. We just didn't take any notice. The year after, by now expecting the first of their three children, the young couple moved back to Sarg, where Werner built them their first home. As well as working as a builder, Werner ran the island ambulance service for many years. The couple also opened a jewellery shop on the high street. They used to tell all the visitors about us, and I felt like some sort of sideshow. One, one came and stood on the step of the shop and said, oh, yes, that's her, and this sort of thing, and I thought, oh, gracious. And she said, uh, have you any German relics left? And I said, yes, one. <laughs> I lent her museum, and I thought afterwards, I shouldn't have said it, but anyway, it all got a wicked sense of humour at times. My uh, BMW here. <laughs> 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 you got Phyllis believed that although the Sark way of life survived the occupation, in recent years the island changed. Not least with the end of its feudal system of government, in which she sat for many years as one of 40 landowners. The incomers, they like, they, oh, it's wonderful, that's why they come. And as soon as they've been here five minutes, they're wanting to introduce English ways of life. Some of them even want street lighting. Well, I mean, who's going to pay for it at 41 pence a unit? And we don't need it. We use a flash lamp and that's it. I mean, we're in decline. And of course it'll change. When you say you're in decline? Well, the, the islanders are, I think we're in a minor, well, I'm sure we're in a minority now, the true islander. We have a saying, we see them come and we see them go, but it's true. And yet here we're, we're still there forever. <laughs>